Um, thank you all for coming. I know it's a really busy time of year uh, to celebrate the presentation of our Innovator of the Year Award. Um, we're gonna have a, a event in a couple of different parts. The first part's gonna be organized by Rana Gupta to have a, a, a moderator panel of past Ignition awardees to talk about their journey and innovation. And then uh, we'll invite Ken Luchin up to present the Innovator of the Year Award. And then Professor Chang has is, is agreed to share some of his thoughts on his process of innovation, which I think is interesting. So thank you for that, Professor Chang. So Rana, let you take it away. Hey. Hello. You cool commercialization cats. So this is our third um, researcher on tap presentation. So it's a spin on the research on tap to the researcher on tap because we'll we'll hear from six of our colleagues and their journey um, so far. So this is the 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 outline of what we're going to do today. Uh, so there it is the with the ER capitalized for the researcher on tap because the whole point was. What I did was, as is my nature, I interviewed all of the six panelists in advance. We sat down and had an interview. And so I'll, the focus here is people over ideas. That in the world of commercialization, it's people who create impact. So let's hear from these people and their journeys and what they've learned. So the questions that I asked them in advance, which now let's see what they did with those answers, uh, are as follows. So in the spirit of don't go it alone, um, so, as is my nature, if you ever visit me in my office, I say, so let's just say we made a cocktail party. How do you introduce yourself, right? How would you say, hi, I'm Rana, you know, this is what I do, and how would you introduce yourself? So I asked them each, how do you introduce yourself? And then I said, where do you think you are? How would you characterize where you are in your career? And then if you've ever read anything I've written or talked to me about an idea, I have two first questions. The first first question is, what's your objective? Why are you doing this? What's your, what would make you happy? This idea, not what's the idea going to achieve? Why are you doing this? So what's your objective? And then what's the need that your idea is addressing? Then we went on to, ah, by the way, what is the idea? Right, and the whole point, you'll see where, where that falls in the order of what I'm trying to achieve here. I didn't start with the idea because I'm interested in the people. So I want to hear from them and how they describe themselves. What pathway have you chosen to bring this idea to market? And then I said, all right, where did the story start? Knowing that probably they started years ago, actually. And I was right, right? We'll hear from some of these started 20 years ago and now they're still working on them. And I just wanted to impress everybody in the audience. This doesn't happen quickly, right? This happens over time in stages. Where are you now? Now, in terms of don't go it alone, what are some of the resources that you've used along the way? Help us understand who else have you depended upon and learned from to get you to here? And then what's next for your idea? And then what are a top couple of things that you've learned from this? And anything surprised you? Maybe something in yourself that surprised you or something that you learned or some reality that you didn't realize where the world really works. So I left that open-ended. So those are the questions I asked all of our researchers for, for this presentation today, the researcher on tap. Um, so with that, can I ask the panelists to come on up? Well, actually, you can come one by one, I suppose. So Arturo, come on up, and then we can do is your slides are all set, and then you can have a seat, and we'll go in order. Thank you, Rana. So today I'm going to talk about my Ignition Award, which was centered on impacting a group of diseases known as immune-mediated inflammatory diseases. Uh, these are basically a group of disorders that encompass autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis, cystic uh, lupus, MS, and you know when your immune system completely goes off the rails known as a cytokine storm. We saw this with COVID-19 quite a bit, right? That's why a lot of people died. So this is affects 23 million people in America, hundreds of millions of people worldwide, a huge economic cost. Uh, we're not very good at treating these diseases, so we wanted to kind of make a difference in this space. And the way we wanted to go about doing that is by targeting these proteins called cytokines that operate as the molecular messengers of the immune system. So you can see here you have two immune cells. They're sending all of these signals back and forth to one another, right? And uh, that's kind of key. Very simple if it's just those two cells. Take the whole immune system, it gets really complicated really fast. And whenever you start to have a dysregulation or the kind of system goes out of whack, too much signal, too little signal, you end up with something that can drive disease. 
why haven't we been good at targeting these things uh, with drugs? Well, I think this kind of exemplifies the problem. Here you're seeing kind of in green as a cytokine, it looks like a baseball. It's docked with its receptor, which looks like a baseball glove. And we're basically asking a small molecule drug to kind of block the baseball from filling the glove, right? Very hard to do. We don't know how to really design molecules like this yet. This is called the protein-protein interaction problem in drug development. So the dogma says, this is too hard. We can't really do this. So the way we decide to approach this problem is by using a new technology or relatively new technology called small molecule microarrays, basically a glass slide. Tens of thousands of small molecules are on the surface, and you can basically flow your cytokine over it and see which sticks. And that gives you kind of a good foot in the door as to what could then be an inhibitor later on down the road. So the path, right? That's kind of the, what the award is about. How did we get to this point? So I started here in 2015. You know, I'm kind of a bit of a local now at this point. I did my graduate studies at Harvard. I did my postdoc with Bob Langer at MIT. I have some biotech experience from that. Uh, so when I started my lab, I had this idea of targeting cytokines with small molecules. First step was find the right collaborator, right? So we collaborate with the Kohler lab at MIT. They manufacture these small molecule microarrays that we'd like to use to kind of find these small molecules hits. And it worked so well, we actually had success with our very first project. So we found the first small molecule to a cytokine called IL-4, something that was considered to be too hard to target with small molecules. That then led to a conversation with Tom McMurray, uh, at our, our, my OTD rep, right? And uh, while we were talking about IP around this molecule, uh, we told him of our future plans. And he pointed us in the direction of Rana Gupta and the Ignition Award mechanism. And that allowed us to get the money to basically go big. Right, So it, the whole idea was if it worked for IL-4 in this one cytokine that was supposed to be so hard, why wouldn't it work for all the rest of them? So we wanted to go after the other 33 human cytokines that are involved in disease. With that award mechanism, we've now built this huge binding map, 65,000 small molecules against 33 human cytokines. So you can imagine the number of interactions that we've been able to, to basically uh, uh, chalk up and be able to now study to understand what sort of structures can inhibit what cytokines. And now we've gotten given Tama heck of a lot more work, <laughs> but he's still smiling. And so now we've, through this whole process, have had a lot of conversations with pharma, with biotech, with clinicians, uh, you name it, to kind of figure out what is that kind of deliverable package that's going to be licensable for a pharmaceutical company or serve as the foundational IP for a startup. So don't go it alone, right? That's the theme, right? So from collaborators, right, kind of key to get the project off the ground and moving along to being having a good relationship with your OTD rep, as you can see here, it's been very helpful in moving this project forward to then enter into uh, Rana's faculty entrepreneurship ecosystem and the resources that that brings to bear, in addition to understanding how to approach all these conversations with pharma and biotech, et cetera. So lesson number one, right? A uh, great quote by Albert Einstein, right? Intelligent people ignore, ignore what? Ignore dogma right? Um, just only quick point to make here, it's just that recognition that dogma is an expression of what our abilities are at a certain point in time, right? 20 years ago, I would have agreed that this project would have been too hard, right? That would have been true 20 years ago, but we're more capable 20 years later, and so it's worth revisiting and ignore what that dogma was. Lesson number two, it's probably a cliche, but yes, persistence is rewarded, right? If whenever you're kind of challenging conventional wisdom, people will be naturally skeptical. So you have to be persistent in order to convince them. And I think that in this project has been very true and kind of leads into kind of the last point, right? Where, you know, these kind of projects will eventually influence the way people think about how to treat at the bedside, right? So a few years ago, pharmaceutical companies were kind of telling us, this is too hard, you can't really do this. Now, for the first time at the ACS meeting in August, there's gonna be a meeting, small molecules targeting cytokines organized by pharmaceutical scientists. How in the world did that happen? Persistence, right? We can change the way people think. Thank you. All right, Daniel. Well, thank you for giving this opportunity to explain my path until this podium today here. So I was born, raised, and PhD in Barcelona. And then I packed all my life in a suitcase and take a plane to, to do my postdoctoral training at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut, 
where I spent a good seven, eight years. And then I did a new trip. This time was shorter by car, but I definitely more suitcases and a whole family uh, tugging along. Where, uh, to Boston, where I joined the Department of Biochemistry at the medical school. And since then I've been a, an assistant professor, hopefully now in the path to promotion and finally, finally sharing the, the imposter syndrome. So, but it all started way back uh, in 2008 when I started the postdoc to answer a very simple question. How we generate a new life from the point of view of RNA regulation? And to this end, uh, I dedicated my postdoc to study, to study two main regulators of RNA, microRNAs and RNA binding proteins. And that led to the discovery of uh, many RNA binding proteins that are involved in early embryogenesis as well as in many other biological processes. But uh, that led us uh, to two main, two fundamental questions. One is, what is the role of these RNA protein interactions? And also, how we can modulate and impact those uh, RNA binding protein interactions for therapeutic purposes. These two simple, si uh, simple questions, but uh, experimentally extremely complex, led to over two years of excruciating and grueling work, dealing with techniques that are uh, a week-long protocol and not with very high success rate. Uh, and this is the key of the problem. Uh, studying RNA binding proteins is very complicated. The protocols are not yet up to par. And that led that, uh, that, uh, that is the cause that over, uh, we have in the human genome over uh, 1,500 RNA binding proteins. And they are actually the cause of over 20% of the Mendelian diseases. However, there are zero marketed drugs for RNA binding proteins. This is because nobody can measure what's the activity of an RNA binding protein. So I knew that in my lab, I will not be able to convince anybody to do the, the techniques that I did when I was a postdoc. So that's the dash of laziness. I didn't want to go back to the bench myself or to, to train somebody for that. And also with the help of uh, the gold hands of a uh, very, very talented postdoc, Dmitry Kretov, we completely changed the, the landscape. We developed a whole new technology that can, for first time, measure the activity of RNA binding proteins in vivo in a quantitative manner, and that really opens a whole set, a whole new family of proteins for drug development. And uh, basically, uh, traditional attempts to drug RNA binding proteins have uh, a low per, a low success rate. Uh, whole libraries of small molecules quickly dwindle down to very few targets, um, very few lead components. And what our technology does is basically uh, really quantitatively measure the activity of RNA binding proteins and directly in vivo. We don't need to purify proteins. We can quickly skip the middleman and go to the goal, which is the, the, the how we can modulate the proteins in vivo. So, of course, uh, I really thank you, OTV, for the help along these lines. I had this epiphany moment that, okay, maybe this is really good, finally. And I contact them very, 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 very early on, as they say in the, in, in the web page, and I really was welcomed by Tom and Elena. And, but, they, but I didn't know what I was getting into. And of course, they offered the, the, the help and, and the, the path to uh, patent and commercialization. But first, they give me homework, a lot of homework. And PIs don't like uh, homework that is not about papers, grants, or their science. But I must say that that was the, the key factor and the eye-opening experience uh, that brings me today here. Because when I thought that, OK, this seems a good idea. Let's just uh, protect it with a patent, and maybe somebody might be interested in it. Thanks to this homework, they made me realize about the dark side of science industry. Now I call it the other side uh, because I learned a lot and they, I like them more. But uh, they, 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 the idea of my goal evolved by knowing more about the, the industry. And I realized that, okay, maybe we could do a service company 
But really, ultimately, I realized that nobody had the secret sauce that we have, and, and we could really make a competitive uh, drug discovery uh, company out there because uh, all the other companies are targeting, uh, that are targeting our demanding proteins are using uh, all technologies and targeting very specific aromatic proteins that are actually enzymes. So I think that we really have uh, an edge here. Hopefully, if not, back to license. And this is not the only thing that I learned during this, this process, uh, but also I realized that, that it's, very, it's very important uh, to have a, a star factor, uh, which hopefully we can build here. Uh, a pedigree that people make you make uh, trust on you and, and in your team, and definitely that there is a lot of work uh, on the path to to the commercialization. But we are fully committed and very uh, full of illusion to to go there. And not only that, but now I I've never will I will never compromise my basic science research. However, now I have an eye. I keep an eye on what can be translated, and I can call Rana or Nevena and say, hey, I have another basic research that might be of interest for you. Thank you. That's Hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. So uh, my story, I think it's a slightly different story. I came to BU already in 2008. And very, very quickly, um, I was lucky enough to publish a paper and, and get to know the OTD people through a different story than the one I'm gonna tell today, but one way or another, it's all connected. So the world of, uh, of cancer therapy really was a completely uh, revolutionized by a paradigm shift uh, discovery of, of what is called immunotherapy. And, and there are many different favors of this immunotherapy, but just to, to give you an example, uh, cancers with metastasis that used to give patients not more than a year are today a cure. Uh, so it's really completely changed the way that we think about cancer therapy. And one of these uh, immunotherapies are called CAR or chimeric antigen receptors. And the way that is done today, you extract cells from the patient, each patient, modify them outside the body. It can take up to four or five months and then you put them back in the body, in the patient. Um, it's an extremely long and complex uh, platform and, and extremely expensive because they run half a million dollars per patient. So the field knew that some, we needed something new. And my laboratory is part of a center for regenerative medicine. And that center works with stem cells. We, we love stem cells. And we use one particular type of stem cells called iPSC, so induced pluripotent stem cells, uh, mainly to learn about how cells make each other in the body, and we use them also to study diseases. It's great for disease modeling. And so these iPS cells have this amazing capacity to they can go become any cell in our, in our body, in our tissues and organs. So that's what we do every day. And that really is the role and the mission of the, of the CREM to learn basic biology and understanding cell fate, cell fate decisions. And we run grants, of course, and we establish a lot of collaborations. I am a collaborator by basis, I like that. And, and eventually, sometimes when we uh, discover something that we feel can maybe have a big impact in patients, so we need to do patents. That's what we learn from OTD. And uh, eventually, that patents can be licensed to corporations, and maybe we, one day we will be uh, in patients, which is happening actually today. Um, another path of he getting help from these corporations and companies uh, is by through SRAs or sponsor research agreements. And this is very relevant to my story because uh, as you will see, this is one of the things that happen um, when, when we starting, uh, starting studying this process. So I was very lucky around uh, six years ago, um, uh, Dar Heinz, a spectacular postdoctoral fellow I have, he was doing surgery at that time. And he was in second year of surgery program. He wanted to do basic research. He came to my lab uh, with this dream. He said, I wanna make T cells, especially T-Rex, which is a particular type of T cells um, from IPS cells. And I'm like, sure, we never did that. There are only a couple of world, uh, labs in the world that can maybe do it, but not really great. But I always love immunology, let's, let's do it. Um, and the idea is it's very relatively straightforward and yet somewhat difficult, but uh, the idea would be to create what we call an, an off-the-shelf universal donor. So it's to take an iPS cell um, and make it a universal donor and from that iPS cell to make T cells. So there are these two distinct, but very uh, uh, interrelated uh, platforms. One is the universal, the other one is to actually make the T cells. 
And I, I can already tell you, I didn't put it in the slide, but uh, he worked very, very hard for five years and we found a way to make T cells and NK cells, which is another type of uh, killer cell. Um, and and the, of course the opportunities are uh, endless uh, for cancer immunotherapy. If we can make this CD8 T cells and CD4, which are the helpers ones. And if we can make this CD4, it can also go into the whole world of tolerance and autoimmunity. So the market is huge. And what I didn't put, as I said, uh, we published very recently a paper, he discovered a new role of notch signaling. It's something very basic. You don't expect to find that, but that's what we found. A very important role of notch signaling very early during this differentiation process. So we can now make very uh, uh, in a robust manner uh, T cells and also in case cells out of IPS cells. So, <clears throat> so what, what can I do with that? As I said, uh, in my pre in my previous uh, life, uh, when I just came to BU, I already uh, was very lucky uh, to meet Mike. And, um, and they really, the colleagues at OTD I became more like friends than colleagues. I, we spent a lot of time, a lot of important conversations, philosophical conversations about the role of a scientist, me trying to convince them that I don't care about the money. I don't care about what we can do. And they trying to convince them, no, no, you can't think like that. This is really the way to go. So somewhere we find each other in the middle, I think. But I, I knew that um, I didn't want to start a company because I already knew that the, the effort, it, it's just too big. And if you go for it, then you need to go full time. And, and I didn't want to stop my, my, my love. Um, you can have a lot of more resources, but it was not what I wanted to focus. So I wanted to keep my love in academia and I wanted to explore other opportunities. So this is the end of the story because I became a scientific founder. So how, how really this happened? As I said, I already have a past experience where we license and, and patent the technology very, very early in my lab. Um, and it wasn't exactly what I expected. It was, it was almost a crazy thing that happened through years of all that uh, experience of licensing a patent and me giving away the plasmid that when I'm not supposed to do that. A lot of interesting uh, moments. Um, but then for this story, it, it was not enough what I had. So uh, I was introduced to RAN, of course, and I, I got awarded an ignition award, which is really for us, for this particular project was key because it was really what helped us uh, make these last steps we needed to actually even publish the paper. It really helped us with that. Um, and then I was I participated in the Spark program. For me, it was an, an opening uh, eye type of experience because um, I didn't know much at all about what it takes to actually go into commercialization. Um, uh, to make the, the this long story short, uh, what happened at the end? Uh, we patented the technology of this how to make IPS cells, and through the Spark program, I got exp exposed to the uh, the idea of the you need to go out and interview. You need twelve interviews. I'm like, come on, for a PI, like Daniel said, you know we don't want to go out looking for interviews. But BU and OTD was very supportive. They gave me some names. I went to talk to these people. In my case, while it was very helpful meeting these people, it was not practically helpful because it didn't really help me do what I wanted. And at, at the end, what happened was I look into my own friends and colleagues, and I've been around in Boston for many years. Uh, so I knew a few people that already were interested in uh, or participating in companies and stuff. And one of them um, was the Derek Rossi. So I, I met Derek Rossi when he was a postdoc. He came to Harvard. And, and, and for those of you that don't know, Derek was actually the actual, the, the actual real founder of Moderna. Um, he's not involved at all with Modern anymore, but um, he really did the whole first uh, step of founding uh, that company. And I knew he had some time, I guess, and he had a lot of experience. So I went to talk to him and I told him his idea. He said, you know, I know, I don't know if you know Chad Cohen. And I knew Chad uh, also from Harvard before. And he said, Chad, is, I think he's thinking about something like a company for immunity. Why don't you go talk to him? So I went for lunch with Chad. And that really was basically the beginning of what happened in our interaction. So he, I, I, uh, show him the data directly. I opened my computer and I show him the data. He loved the data. He said, you know what? I like what I'm seeing. I'm now starting a company. It's really new. Um, he was he was the founder of uh, uh, CRISPR Therapeutics, but now he opened and found his own company, Clay Therapeutics. And we received two SRAs so far. For us, that's a lot of money, uh, almost uh, twice, two as another one. And we spent years writing here. There was no writing, nothing. It's just an SRA, which is great. And the company is doing really well now. It has 65 employees. They did a series A very successfully with $87 million. Um, and we're still uh, evaluating with Neven and Tom my opportunities for licensing technology because it's still out there. But for me, it was really great. I am a scientific founder of Clade. Um, so it really gave me the chance of keeping my lab, um, putting my idea there, my 
my postdoc there actually is one of the first employees of the company, so also work out great for him, and he's the one that knows the most about technology, so uh, they're also doing the, the right things. So I think that's it. Thank you. Huh? All right. Hi, uh, thank you for inviting me to this great event. It's great to hear about uh, everyone's experiences and the, the journeys they took to get to this point. Um, so I'm happy to share mine with you, you all. And just to introduce uh, the topic, uh, Rana mentioned early on that one of the questions that we were asked is, how would you introduce yourself at a party? And, and the way I want to explain this to you is for you to think of a different aspect of this problem. Suppose you're explaining to someone who you are, but there's tons of noise in the background. There are other people talking, there's music, there's clanging of dishes, and the person just can't hear you. So they would not learn very much about you as, a, as an innovator at all under those situations. Uh, but some people have this ability to selectively listen and understand to this type of a conversation. And this is the ability that I'm referring to as selective listening. And, and, and so we've been very interested in this problem. And our, our driving goal is to actually try to transform how people communicate in an increasingly noisy world. And uh, there's a lot of demand for this because it turns out that many different people run into this challenge at some point in life, uh, including people with impairments or even people as they age in many different conditions. And uh, while there's lots of devices that try to tackle aspects of this problem, um, basic, basically our experience talking to people is that whether you're spending a few dollars or thousands of dollars on these types of technologies, you're not gonna be very satisfied with the results and sort of this noise reduction. Uh, and in fact, uh, one surprise that we came across through the ignition process was that surprisingly hearing aids are not the first market where uh, we discovered we wanted to really apply these uh, types of uh, solutions. And I'll tell you more about that later. But uh, one of the things we learned way back when we started working on this problem in 2005 was that a lot of the literature on how brains process sounds, which is the key to the solution, uh, is that the literature had mostly focused on sound processing in isolation, that is without any background noise. So while we knew a lot of uh, basic facts about these mechanisms, um, the issue of how sounds are segregated was completely poorly understood. And on the technology side, the big uh, technology was sound cancellation, right? And noise cancellation, sound cancellation is a fantastic technology. But what, what noise cancellation does, it, it reduces both the background noise and the target sound. So you don't end up with better discrimination of the sounds that you really want to uh, listen to. So we were very interested in how is it that the brain uh, does this selective listening? And uh, essentially, we looked at the mechanisms in central areas in the brain, like auditory cortex, to understand and to pursue what are the mechanisms that allow auditory cortical neurons to extract a sound of interest from background noise. Uh, and the advantage there is that basically you can reduce the background noise without reducing the target sound of interest. And you can really listen to that sound that you're trying to focus on. And so that led to a lot of uh, discovery and development in the lab, focusing on basic mechanisms of how neurons in the brain are able to do this. And from that, we were able to develop an algorithm, a brain inspired algorithm for segregating target sounds from background noise. And it gives you basically what you want, which is accurate discrimination of the target sound and reduce the background noise. Uh, and we were happy to receive a patent for this work. And now through the help of OTD and others, uh, we are moving towards license, licensing this patent. Um, our, our goal is to actually develop a demo which has been enabled by the Ignition Award. And basically we would like to demo it at a noisy convention center, let's say Heinz Convention Center where there's an industrial fair going on. And we approach people and say, hey, try this on. And they would put on this device and it would allow them to focus more on the person they're trying to converse with and really subdue the background noise. So that is the uh, demo that uh, thanks to the Ignition Award we are working on developing on. Uh, we already have a real time version of it and uh, we still have some time to make some further improvements and hope to demo it at an industrial fair, for example. Um, so in terms of uh, looking back on this process, uh, it's been a very interesting journey. Uh, I wish I had kind of stepped outside of academia a little bit more and gone to these industrial fairs where people are devising 
uh, devices and technologies to deal with this problem. Uh, it's a different perspective, which really helped me and, and people at OD, OTD really helped connect me to people that think from a different side about this technology. So it's been very, very helpful. Um, in terms of commercialization strategies, uh, similar to a story you heard before, um, I love my day job as a researcher. I love neuroscience and I, I just love going to the lab and doing uh, what I do. So for me, uh, the, the, the funnest part is to propose really interesting problems and find creative solutions to that. Uh, I've been consistently inspired by the brain, which is an amazing com computational device that can solve really, really hard problems. And in this particular case, the problem of segregating sounds from background noise. Uh, so I continue to, I want to continue to do that research. And, um, and from that point of view, my strategy is going to be to license this technology to other companies who can get it quickly to end users and to consumers. Um, but along the way, I needed to learn a lot and still am learning a lot about uh, what are the right companies and that will take this technology and get it to users uh, who are going to be uh, interested in using it. Uh, one of the surprises was that turns out hearing, aid, uh, hearing aids was not a great first, first market uh, because they're, they are really interested in in-house technologies. They really don't want to talk that much to people that are building technologies that are not in-house. So that was interesting uh, insight that came out of the Catalyst program and other programs through OTD. Uh, so along the way, um, we didn't do it alone, and we had a lot of help from many, many people along the way, certainly uh, many graduate students uh, that helped contribute to this project, uh, great community in the BU Hearing Research Center, which really motivated working on this problem because there was so little known at the point when I joined the Hearing Research Center. Um, I learned a tremendous amount from OTD and got a lot of help from them at very early stages related to IP and getting the patent uh, from people like Mike Pratt. Francis Forrester, uh, then moved on to a slightly more uh, a phase of business development with Rana, with lots of help from Rana and pitching from Linda, and the funding from the Ignition Award was absolutely key. Uh, through the Catalyst programs, we learned about what are the potential licensees, what are the first markets that we want to target potentially with this type of technology, and the MAP program, additional market research and opportunities there. Uh, we were exposed to in investors who pointed out that you know, you really might want to get a nice demo here together. Like while you have the paper and you have a figure in the paper with the stats, it's just different to have someone take on the technology to wear it and to experience the results right there and then. So as Russ put it, you need a razzle dazzle demo that you can take out to industry fairs and have people really try it on and, and see how it works. So that's what the Ignition Award has really enabled. Uh, so our, our main strategy is licensing at this point. We are collaborating with OTD to structure and learn about licensing agreements. And one idea is to make it flexible enough so that we can engage multiple industries that could benefit from this technology, not just hearing aids. And um, my personal motivation uh, in terms of coming for full circle with this process is that, you know, I continue to be amazed by the brain and how it does these amazing problems and solve these amazing problems. Uh, and now there's a nice connection between as we learn more, most, more about these basic mechanisms in the brain, we can translate that into better technologies, into better brain-inspired algorithm for solving these types of problems. So that's very satisfying uh, for me as a neuroscientist. So thank you very much for your attention. All right. Thank you, Rana. So uh, I'm um, Larry Ziegler, a professor of chemistry, uh, former chair of the department. I'm an experimental chemical physicist, um, and my expertise is in light matter interactions. I know uh, when I started this project, I knew absolutely nothing about microbiology. I quite frankly couldn't tell you the difference between a viral particle and a bacterial cell, but that was 20 years ago. Uh, when I uh, first got uh, started, as I said, on, in, in this project, in this path, and I'm just going to talk a little bit primarily about my path uh, as it evolved uh, from um, uh, a project in the post 9-11 world where uh, people were concerned about uh, bio threat uh, organisms and how that evolved to a platform uh, which can, uh, I think, um, help tell uh, doctors what the best antibiotic to treat infections are. 
So my target uh, more recently has evolved because I'm a laser guy. So here I am, got my laser. I don't go anywhere without my, my laser. Um, so blood infections are uh, the key target of the uh, of our current studies, and uh, the reason is that blood infections can have very serious consequences. Uh, it leads to a condition called sepsis, which is the body's infl inflammatory uh, response, uh, and um, that uh, can lead to morbidity, uh, increasing mor morbidity and mortalities. Uh, a, a, a number that I found I think was quite remarkable, the 20% of global deaths in 2017, so yes, pre-COVID, uh, were, were due to bacteremic uh, complications, that is blood infections. 1.7 million Americans develop sepsis uh, annually, so that's a large number. So when a person presents at a, at a clinic or hospital with a potential bloodstream infection, uh, the uh, the physician uh, initially prescribes a broad spectrum uh, antibiotic, and that is a practice that has contributed to the exploding problem of multi uh, drug resistance. So it's these issues that uh, fundamentally form the background of what we're looking to address, particularly currently. And the problem is that the gold standard methods for determining antibiotic susceptibility which is to say, you know, what drugs are effective for, effective for a given um, uh, bacterial uh, pathogen, uh, is that the method's very slow because they're based on growth. So for example, if you're presenting with a blood infection, uh, typically uh, the whole process can take something like two, sometimes three days because there's 24 hours first that's involved with growing up uh, the bacteria that are in blood. They're initially present at very low levels, and so you have to grow them up in a, in a sea of 10 to the ninth red blood cells and all the other things in blood. And then there's the second growth step where you expose these isolated uh, bacteria to various antibiotics, and, and by gold standard methods, uh, there's this slower growth step as well, which can take anywhere from eight hours, if you're lucky, to 36 hours. And that identifies what's called the minimum inhibitory um, concentration. The other is telling you whether a drug is effective or not for a given presentation and how much is typically needed. So the, we're presenting or I'm developing an alternative uh, methodology. It's based on surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. It's an optical technology. Uh, the key, two key elements of that technology is, first of all, it's extremely sensitive to some key metabolites of bacterial cells. And then the other bit, which was just discovered by accident, was that these metabolites are very responsive, uh, that, that the rate of the formation of these uh, metabolites is very responsive uh, to bacterial exposure to various uh, antibiotics. And so if we have a partial growth step, which is absolutely needed, and say that's on the order of five or six hours, uh, exposing uh, those, uh, those uh, pathogens to antibiotics and using our SERS methodology, it takes just 40 minutes to determine a minimum inhibitory concentration. So this is an enormous savings, seven hours as compared to, uh, let's say, two hours. I think it's fair to say that I could not have predicted where this technology overall would be at uh, from the uh, start of this uh, experience. Uh, as I said, uh, it, it, it uh, really was uh, based on the fact that I had uh, expertise in Raman spectroscopy. Uh, back it dates back to my um, back my thesis days. And the Photonic Center, I don't remember if it was you, Tom, or predates you, but the Photonic Center was putting together an initiative at that point to uh, develop techniques in the post 9 11 world to rapidly identify bio threats. You know, you, I think you may recall that Bacillus anthracis was an organism that there was much concern about in those days. Uh, and the, the task was identification. Okay. The story I'm going to tell you is, in fact, a two-part story. The first step was identification. 
Uh, and then we did get money uh, for that, and that worked quite, quite uh, reasonably well, I would say. Uh, and, and then uh, we moved on in the, in the years from those initial steps to then bring it to clinical applications for identifying uh, bacteria that were involved in or urinary tract infections, STDs, uh, and blood infections. And you know, we had money from the sources that you see here. Uh, I was pretty far along in this project, maybe, oh, I don't know, maybe 10 years, uh, where until I I figured out just what these SIRS signatures were due to. Uh, and, and that was uh, quite important in making that uh, discovery. And, and, and then uh, a little time after that, we figured out what the molecular components are. That moved on to the second stage of this story. I, I pivoted to a different value for the overall technology. And that is to say uh, that I pivoted to um, uh, determining these antibiotic susceptibility uh, profiles and, and doing that very rapidly. That's what I discovered was the real, the greatest value of this overall approach. So here's just a brief example. So here I'm showing you SIR spectra uh, of these metabolites, in fact, as a function of their exposure to a uh, particular antibiotic. This is levofloxacin. And, and you see if I, if I, uh, just use bars to represent the overall intensity of the spectra, that once we get to a certain concentration, the intensity dramatically drops. And that, in fact, is the MIC, the minimum inhibitory uh, concentration. In contrast, this is the same organism, but it's a different drug. It's one that it's resistant to. The SERS intensity doesn't change uh, the, despite wh whatever the, uh, the dosage is. Um, and the only difference is that it's a different antibiotic. It's one the organism is resistant to. And so I, I, this is right, the, the, the MICs that are determined here are, are exactly those that are given by 24 hour growth. The difference is this is accomplished 30 times faster. It's within 40 or 45 minutes. So as far as I know, this is the fastest phenotypic uh, AST uh, platform. Uh, that I have seen on the market or even that I know about uh, under development. So in terms of, you know, what kind of lessons that I have learned from my long history with this uh, subject? Well, one thing to say is that, and other projects through the years, that I, I think it's true that the, the most impactful, the best discoveries that I've ever made uh, in my career are things that I couldn't predict. You know, None of the most interesting things, of course, have appeared in my proposals. Um, and, and perhaps the point is that the talent is in recognizing the value of, the, of, of what you're seeing uh, right in front of you. Uh, and then the final point that I make to, uh, well, my kids and my students uh, is that uh, it's really crucial to have a fundamental understanding of what you're looking at. I think that's really uh, an important value. Uh, it, it tells you uh, about where your technology can have other applications. It tell you about, tells you about limitations. And it's also in the context of what this is about, I have found it to be also a, a, a very helpful value for selling literally uh, the, the technique. So uh, let's see. Part one of this I told you about was the, the role of the photonic center leadership in uh, uh, establishing this effort in the post 9-11 world. They put me in touch uh, with, well, what was really crucial was a company called Microbiotics who uh, taught us uh, experimentalists in uh, light matter interactions, uh, what um, uh, microbiology we needed to be able to carry out these studies. Uh, there were other BU expertise, a shout out to Helen Fawcett, Tom, uh, who uh, helped us build hardware do, do, do through these years. Uh, the other person here who is crucial is uh, my uh, postdoc, uh, Dr. Ranjith uh, Pramasiri, who invented the serous substrates, these nanostructured structured surfaces that we use throughout all of these uh, studies. Um, and of course, the students and other uh, colleagues at, at BU that I'm not going to mention, but I, I, I do want to talk about this transformation. So part one was the identification. Uh, and a really helpful bit was being able to collaborate with Fraunhofer, who are just across the street here, 
we had a great uh, NIH award that was a lot of fun. Um, uh, Alexis Sarah Budge was the formal PI on that. Uh, Kathy Clapperich was part of that effort. Uh, Jean Lee at Harvard Medical was another part of that effort, really crucial in, um, in seeing how this technology could potentially be applied to blood infections for identification. Of course, once we learned near the end of the ward what, what the chemicals were due to, and we pivoted to this antibiotic susceptibility testing, that's when the ignition board was extremely helpful. Uh, that allowed us to uh, to generalize this phenomenon to uh, about 70 pairs of drugs and antibiotics. So it can really show the, the general phenomenon uh, and its ubiquitous nature. And uh, that was enormously helpful. Although I will point out that when we went back to the ignition spigot again this year, we did not get money, which I was not very happy about. Mm -hmm as Rana knows. So what are we gonna do about this? Uh, I am nearing the end of my academic career, uh, not necessarily my scientific career. And I'm not interested in uh, setting up a startup to try to exploit this technology. What I'm actively doing is seeking a commercial partner, either an aspiring player or a uh, established player in the disease diagnostics market. And I have ongoing uh, conversations about that. I will say about the Ignition Award uh, that one of the components, and I think this has been alluded to elsewhere, of the Ignition Award was, was uh, Rana forced us, I think, or at least he was, he was holding back the money until uh, we, we had uh, you know, something on the order in total, probably of 12 conversations with end users. And I hated that. I thought, what a waste of time. Um, and it was great. It was really great. And it's those conversations that have formed the partners that I'm, I'm looking to uh, develop this technology with. And the hope is that this will find impact in clinical settings uh, and uh, provide for better health outcomes. That would give me great satisfaction. Thank you. Yep. All right, hello. All right, good afternoon, everyone. So people over ideas. That was the challenge that Rana uh, gave me and Linda worked very closely with the last week before this presentation. And so I'm very happy to be with you here today to share a little bit about my journey from son to physical therapist to wannabe entrepreneur. Um, uh, my name is Lil Wad. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Physical Therapy. And when Rana first interviewed me, the first question he asked me was, who are you? How do you think of yourself? And so my response to him was, well, it depends on the context. In a professional setting, I'm going to say something like, I'm a faculty member at Boston University where I run a research lab that studies human movement and uses that knowledge to develop new technologies to help people with impaired movement uh, move better again in the real world. But I've got my priorities straight because if I'm at per, a per, personal context, like I'm at a Giants game and the guy next to me asks me who I am, I'm not going to talk about my research lab. I'm going to talk about how I'm a bleeding blue Giants fan who absolutely hates the Eagles. My wife is a Philadelphia fan, so she don't tell her I said that. But on a more serious note, um, my entrepreneurial journey really begins with my family and more specifically my father. So my father came to this country in 1977 with $44 in his pocket, came from Egypt. In Egypt, he was trained as an engineer. Um, but in the States, he had to work 10 years at a gas station to save up enough money to return to school in order to recomplete his bachelor's in engineering. And uh, when he first got, when he got his first job, it was at New York City as a city engineer. And eventually he worked his way up to be a project manager leading some uh, pretty big projects that we were all very proud of him about, um, like the Build a Back program for Hurricane Sandy. And then after 9-11, he served as um, project manager for the cleanup and restoration for some of the sites. And so in my mind, my dad was unstoppable. And so when he had a stroke, when I was in high school, and I was confronted with his doctor saying that he may never walk the same way again. I thought they were crazy. They didn't know who my dad was, what he had accomplished, what he was able to do. I just knew that there had to be 
more that, he, that we could do. And so that's really the story behind our technology, the Renew. So um, there wasn't, there was no magic pill. There was no surgery that could restore his pre-stroke self. Uh, there was just months and months, really years of intensive physical therapy. And it paid off. So here's a picture of my dad about 10 years later after a stroke at a family wedding um, where he is able to stand, walk, even dance by himself. He had fully recovered, but that's a rare recovery pattern after a stroke. Uh, and physical therapy has significant limitations, even today's physical therapy. For example, sitting in front of my dad in a wheelchair is my uncle. My uncle had a stroke around the same time that my father had a stroke. And like most of the 8 million Americans who are currently living after a stroke, for the rest of his life, he had significant challenges with mobility and depended on a wheelchair for getting around. And so knowing what I do professionally over the years, my family has asked me for a solution and I have had to say I've got no solution. And so I've spent this early part of my academic career working on solutions to the motor problems after a stroke. So when patients leave the hospital, they typically leave with a number of devices, canes, walkers, AFOs, or, or articulating fluorothoses. These devices do a decent job at restoring some degree of independence, but they don't provide what's needed for long-term recovery. And so um, what we have been doing with the help of a BU Ignition Award is developing a new technology that can meet a critical need as patients transition from the hospital to the home and community. We've been developing the Renew Neuro Recovery Platform. The very vision for Renew is that patients can use and clinicians can use the technology in the home and hospital setting to augment and enhance physical therapy delivered in the clinic, and then leave the hospital using that same exact technology in the home and the community to make every step that they take therapeutic. And so in the spirit of don't go it alone, my journey really does begin with my family. Our struggle with the consequences of stroke inspires my work on the Renew and serves as a constant source of determination. But the Renew project has also benefited from significant guidance and early funding support from the Office of Technology Development and RANA. In fact, when I first learned about the Ignition program, I was really interested in the money. As a new assistant professor, I just wanted to apply to every possible grant. But it turned out the mentorship and guidance that was also provided was what we actually needed. And beyond mentorship, I can't emphasize enough the importance of cross-disciplinary collaboration. So traditional approaches to translational research take a serial approach. Ideas begin in the lab, they're built by engineers, tested by clinicians, and eventually shelved somewhere because they don't actually meet the needs of users. Um, but our work with the Renew has really benefited from an amazing cross-disciplinary culture in Sargent College and the Department of Physical Therapy. And um, these devices that we're developing right now can't come into existence without these different disciplines coming together. And finally, one of the most critical don't go it alone lessons that I've learned um, is that the importance of inspiration, determination, guidance, funding, knowledge, and skills pales in comparison to having the right boots on the ground. Uh, having the right team in place, um, doing the day-to-day -day work is where I found failure meets success. And I wouldn't hesitate to say that if we are ultimately successful with the Renew technology, it's because it's first brought to life by some of the fellows and students that are shown on this slide. Thank you. Okay, yeah. All right. I did prepare some questions, having chatted with these good people. People often ask me, Ron, are any good ideas coming out of BU? And I always think, yes, but I really enjoy working with you guys. That's really what I think about. So I prepared a few questions. Kamal, when, we, when I was interviewing you, um, you mentioned grad students contributing a, a whole bunch to, to your work. But how has pursuing your idea affected your mentoring of, of students? Uh, so one thing I found is that students are just naturally much more excited when they see a real world problem that has impact on making quality of life better. Uh, this is not something I, I'm, I'm always working on. My work is more basic research oriented. So it was it was different working on an ignition project because um, that was the key element. So what do you mean by more productive for the students? 
So, you know, in, in mentoring graduate students for over 20 years, what I found is that when they're excited, when they're driven, they're much more productive. They solve problems better and faster. Um, going through the ignition uh, process uh, really made me better at articulating real world problems. Mm -hmm. And then that made me a better mentor and them more excited about doing the work. Thank you. So Larry, you mentioned the interviews that somebody forced you to make. And I remember you stopped me in the hall here once. It was far more colorful language that you used that day um, describing the burden. But tell us a little bit more about, you know, who'd you talk to and what are the nature of those conversations that, you know, and what resulted that helped change your decision making? Yeah, well, just very briefly. So I was initially uh, pitching uh, this technology for urinary tract infections. Uh, and I had a series of companies who, um, who who liked what they heard and were very impressed by the the technology. And, and, and at the end of that project, when we spoke to them again, they said, well, that's great. That's really uh, very nice. But, you know, there, there was a lack of enthusiasm because what they really wanted was to see that you were addressing the most difficult problem in infectious diseases, which was blood, blood infections. And I was coming out from the point of view of scientists where I was uh, thinking about solving this problem incrementally. And, and it turns out for reasons I'm not gonna get into that the UTI infections are you know, about four orders of magnitude easier than blood infections. Uh, and uh, now I've refocused my effort on the more difficult holy grail problem of blood infections. Uh, and I am finding that there is, you know, the, the science is the same that we're using. But uh, having that that uh, really big challenge to address is attracting much more interest. And that I got from the interviews. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My pleasure. Arturo, let me ask you the same thing, because you also mentioned um, in our interview talking with clinicians. And But I'm curious, do you talk to corporations, clinicians, investors? Because you mentioned a, a broad array, but we didn't get into the details. Yeah, sure. I mean, from the very beginning of the project, we spoke to all of the above. We spoke to clinicians, we spoke to people in pharma, we spoke to VCs, um, basically each, each kind of different uh, opinion that you get from there helps kind of shape uh, what you'll prioritize in your project, right? The clinicians tell you what's going to be medically most impactful. Uh, pharmaceutical companies will tell you what they're interested in, in terms of pursuing, and a VC firms will tell you what they're willing to invest in, right? Uh, fundamentally, a lot of what's in our project we is is fund up from a science perspective interesting. We could pursue it in a million directions. Uh, but we get take that information into account of what others value, and you can zone in on the things that are most likely to then translate down the line. So it helps us prioritize. Thank you. Um, Gustavo. So the end of your presentation and, and when we chatted, this idea of just reaching out to somebody and having coffee and then opening up your computer. <laughs> So I was shocked, you know, that was really good fun, but just, you said to me in the interview, run a, you know, contact people. But I was just projecting that people in the audience may say, contact them and then say, what next? You know, what do you say next? Literally, fine, I'll call somebody up. What happens next that you take it to the next level of conversation? Yeah, I think that sometimes we are afraid of uh, revealing the secret sauce that we all, uh... If we get lucky, we find in the lab. But for me, I think it was key to be completely open and, and honest. I know it's not easy and not for everyone, but uh, for me, that was a key. I, I really opened the, the computer and show him the data, the actual data. And, and we do need to remember that in most of these people that you interview as potential investors, most of them are very smart people and they do understand in detail what they are looking for. And, and I think that sometimes that, that is part of the failure in if we don't provide the details, the people do not get interested because they, they hear stories all the time. They hear people that come with ideas all the time, but looking into the details and showing them what is actually what you have uh, achieved that is different from other labs, uh, that I think was key. And it, it immediately worked. And I, I mean, you always need a little bit of luck, of course, being the right moment, the right place with the right person. In that case, I, I was lucky that he was just uh, thinking of starting a, a, a startup. So that kind of helps. Did. Um, Daniel, so you mentioned um, starting, uh, your, your idea started as a service-based company, but then I loved your phrase, there was a turn of the wheel, but after a turn of the wheel, you decided to think about a drug development company, but what was the turn of the wheel? What, what, what does that mean? What happened there? 
uh, the turn of the wheel was the change of ideas, the 180 the turn that I did from the, the making a, a service company, a CRO, uh, to the, the goal of now trying to establish our own therapeutic startups as a co-founder and finding the right team, as other mentioned. Uh, the key to this uh, change of mind was the, the homework that I mentioned that OTD uh, made us do. Uh, in this case was, uh, of course, talking to people, but also to looking for what's the industry landscape uh, covering this niche, in particular, the, the study of RMIT in proteins. And I realized that what I was thought, uh, what I thought would be a full uh, field of competitive uh, companies, uh, it was empty. There was only a handful of companies barely uh, scratching the surface of this family of proteins. So why I want to, uh, why make a service company to solve the problem of, of a few companies when I can really tackle and make a difference in the whole field? Ah, so it was the, that, that there was a few number of them and you said, oh, why would I service just a few? I can be one of them. It was a few and also that they were not tackling the, 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 the right targets that they were focused on, on, on a handful of targets. They were on top of each other mm. because they were using all technology that could only target a, a very specific fraction of these 150, uh, 100,500 uh, targets. Okay, thank you. So Lou, um, when we spoke earlier, you said you wish you had talked to more patients and clinicians early on. And so my question is, in, Spirit of don't go alone. Uh, what have you learned now, 10 years later, that perhaps you would have learned then? But, you know, what do you know differently, having now started to talk to more and more patients? Yeah. So, thank you, Rana. <clears throat> and so as a clinician myself who's treated hundreds of patients, I thought I, I knew what the problem was. And so um, I assumed if I built a technology that worked, then my clinician colleagues, and we generated evidence that showed it would work, my clinician colleagues would automatically use it. To me, it was just a very simple, we just got to provide it and then they will use it, build it and they'll come. And I found, we did this twice and there was very little clinical uptake. And so this time around with the Renew, we were prompted by our mentors, business mentors, to have a different kind of conversation, potential stakeholders. And I never heard of the term before, but now I use it all the time, a solution-free discussion. So instead of saying, hey, check out my solution, what do you think? It's let's talk about your problems and then let me understand what your problem is. And then I can better understand how the solution meets my solution meets your problem without ever, you know, tainting the waters with the solution. And so uh, what I think I would have done better 10 years ago is start having those solution free problems and stop being so arrogant and thinking I knew what the problem was. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. So we were the warm up band. So that concludes our warm up band show. Thank you guys very, very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, so, Ken, it's your turn. Okay. Well, thank you, Anu. Thank you, Mike, for inviting me here to present the award for Innovator of the Year to a very special faculty member that we're very proud to have in the College of Engineering and of course at Boston University. This year's Innovator of the Year is Professor Jishin Zhang. Jishin was recruited from Purdue University to Boston University in the summer of 2017 as the Moustakis Professor in Photonics and Optoelectronics. He holds a joint tenure appointment in electrical and computer engineering and in biomedical engineering. He's received many awards, including the Ellis Lippincott Award from the Optical Society of America, He's an elected fellow of the Optical Society of America and the American Institute of Medicine and Biological Engineering, IMB, and the Craver Award for Koblenz Society, just to name a few of his awards. Since arriving at BU, he has demonstrated himself as an innovator of high productivity, exceptional creativity, and an outstanding entrepreneurship, and a fantastic scientist. He's published since 2018, says here, I even don't believe it, but it's true, 92 peer-reviewed articles, six in Nature Communications, five in Light Science and Applications, five in Science Advances, two in PNAS, all as senior author. He's been cited over 33,000 times with an H index of 93 in Google Scholar, but he's far more than a scholar only. 
He is a prolific inventor. Michael Pratt, the managing director of BU's technology development office at OTD, indicates that when Professor Chang visits his office, he's not just making a disclosure for disclosure's sake, but rather he has a practical application in mind and many times has a research sponsor or a business in mind. His creative work has generated 10 patents, and these IPs span the areas of chemical imaging, neuromodulation, and antimicrobial phototherapy. Several of his patents have been licensed to multiple companies and converted into products with a measurable societal impact. And I'll give you some examples. In chemical, engine, uh, chemical imaging, uh, his US patent on deep learning, polygon scan stimulated Raman spectroscopy, mi microscopy, has been licensed to Vibronex Incorporated, co-founded by Jishin and, and a former student, Pu Wang. Vibronex Incorporated generated sales of over 5 million in 2022. Using a successful SBIR STTR grants, his, mul his multiple BU IPs on infrared photothermal imaging have been licensed to Fertil Photothermal Spectroscopy Corporation, for which he is the chief scientific advisor. Since its inception in 2018, Photothermal Spectroscopy Corporation has delivered 45 units of MI RAGE, an infrared photothermal mi microscope, to eight countries, the United States, Canada, France, Germany, UK, Japan, Korea, and China. One example of application of this is mapping protein aggregation in Alzheimer's disease. He has created two new directions since coming to Boston University, one on a genetics-free neuromodulation through optic, for an, an optoacoustic effect, and another on an antimicrobial phototherapy. Ji Shin and collaborator Chen Yang invented a fiber-based optoacoustic emitter that allows sub-millimeter precision ultrasound neuromodulation. This optoacoustic neuromodulation IP, pending um, US utility track one, has received broad industrial interest. For example, Axorus, if I said it correctly, a company located in Paris, recently licensed this IP for retinal stimulation as an, at an unprecedented spatial resolution. In antimicrobial phototherapy, uh, Ji Shin and coworkers invented methods to treat or uh, methods to treat the superbug MRSA. He's invented and generalized approaches to treat drug-resistant pathogens by photo inactivation and co-founded Pulse Thera. I have no idea if I said that right which aims to commercialize this approach to treat broad category of infections, including MRSA, Candida, or ERS, that impose a huge threat to human health. Dr. Ji Shin Shang is a textbook example of the values and processes that lead to successful entrepreneurship and the kind of convergent scientist and societal engineer we want on our faculty. So congratulations to Ji Shin, and let me offer you Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> I would have known you get your yeah, I would have invented something myself. Please say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Kang. Um Thank you. First, thank you all being here today for me. Uh, uh, first, I will thank my current and former students, postdoc, my BU colleagues, and my family. This is not possible with a, a strong support to me. My name, Ji, Ji Xing, exactly means continuous innovation in Chinese. <laughs> so today I'm going to spend 10 minutes to tell you how continuous innovation happens to Ji Xing. <laughs> So I'm a Chinese. In the Chinese philosophy, the universe is driven by interforce between yin and yang. And a word to describe this world is change. So in my view, no fear to change is a foundation for innovation. And innovations are often driven by the opposite in this yin and yang picture. In 2003, I was trained as a physical chemist in, Cam in Harvard, and I was just got a very good offer from a very pretty decent chemistry department. 
Then I got this very special offer from Purdue University, biomedical engineering. I had no idea what is biomedical engineering. I talked to Sonny and he, my advisor, he told me they make artificial bones. <laughs> <laughs> but in the end, I accept the Purdue offer because I said, I want to do something different from you from chemistry. And it turns out that's a very good decision because I was able to bring spectroscopy into the engineering discipline. And that uh, helped me to create, grow a new field called chemical imaging. Actually this year I just launched the first Gordon Research Conference on chemical imaging. But teaching has been a difficulty for me in engineering, right? So I, I was fortunate to have a very capable father-in-law who can teach me electronics before I go to class. But that created opportunities so this is one example. In one of the lectures, I teach this uh, a cascade of our LC circuits to model the cochlea. So each circuit is amplified one frequency of sound. So that's why we can hear all frequencies of sound. We borrowed this idea from the undergraduate class to uh, my research and build a 32 channel tuned amplifier array. So here each board can amplify the, this called a stimulant Raman signal at the one frequency. This creates actually the fastest Raman spectrometer in the world, five microseconds per Raman spectrum. This got me two US patents and actually uh, finally a science and engineering grant from Keck Foundation. But there are also other barriers for translation of clinical translation chemical microscopy, the limited imaging depths into a tissue. In 2007, I was using cars to image cardiovascular disease. And we can see this beautiful plaque, but we have to cut the artery to see through the cross section because the cast microscopy, which is my major work as a postdoc, only has a penetration depth of 100 micron. And that is not possible to do in vivo detection in the hospital, right? So other groups are using adaptive optics, but that only increased two to three times. So that time there's no way to break this barrier because we need a millimeter imaging depth. An idea came to me in 2009. So at that time, at that year, my wife and I expecting our first child. And we had to go to hospital every month to do ultrasound because the doctor suspected some water in his kidney. But the, the boy is okay. He's taller than me now. So, but at that time, I was super impressed by this ultrasound image. It can go that deep, my goodness. And it can see through the whole body. But I was a physical chemist, I'm still a physical chemist. And I knew that after vibrational excitation, all the energy will go to heat. And if we use a pulsed excitation, we can produce a transient ultrasound to generate uh, transient heat to produce ultrasound. The difficulty is that we knew nothing about ultrasound or photoacoustic research in my team. So I invited Li Hong, who was a pioneer of using PA to do blood to produce to give a seminar in biomedical engineering. And then I convinced him that I can send a student to his, the first author of this paper to his lab to learn the very basics of photoacoustics. In 2011, we uh, published this paper, uh, a new way of bond selective imaging by listening to vibrational excited molecules. So this can go deeper as a few millimeter. This method allowed for the first time that we can see the lipid laden plaque uh, from the lumen side. And this built the foundation for in vivo detection by uh, through a caster. This paper also saved my mid-career because at that time I was never able to renew my R01 on cars, my cars could be. But this new data allowed me to get an R21, R01 National Innovation Award and a, a recent renewal of the R01. In 2014, I co-founded this Vibron Inc. with my former student, Pu Wang, who is now CEO of the company. And the, we have a dream. The dream is to convert that uh, method into a, a device to really for in vivo detection of this vulnerable plague, the number one killer in the United States in a human. Then we realized that it's 100 times more difficult to make a clinical product than just publishing a paper. But the Vibronics now is already a 30 people business and uh, we made other FDI approval device for, for other simpler purpose. Um, 
And last year, the Vibon produced a sales of 30 million Chinese yuan or 5 million US dollar in 2022. In research, we feel most of the time, as we know that, but the wisdom tells that the, the weakness can become a strength if you look at the same data from a different angle. In 2017, I was, we are using this uh, transient absorption microscopy to image the detect the MRSA by imaging the golden pigments. Initially, the signal was very strong, but then in 0.5 seconds, the signal completely disappeared due to photo bleaching. So this is absolutely a failed project from the imaging and diagnosis perspective, right? But we did not stop here. Instead, we asked a different question. We asked that can we kill MRSA this way by bleaching these golden pigments? It turns out that's indeed the case because these pigments called STX result in the membrane. So if we break down the molecule, we can make the membrane leaky so that uh, the small molecule like hydrogen peroxide can go into the cell and uh, kill the bacteria. The Brink reported our finding in 2019 and many people read the news and uh, they write to me because there are many MRSA patients. And in November, 2019, a guy from Colorado wrote to me with some astonishing data. He had a MRSA infection and the antibiotics did not work for him for three months. He was desperate. And then he followed our protocol on mice. That's our paper did on his arm. And the, the blue light plus hydrogen peroxide saved his forearm in three days. In uh, the same year, we uh, funded a post era that, uh, to try to aim to uh, converted this into a medical device or broader patient use. While well, I'm playing just different projects for fun uh, during the year, during, driven by curiosity, uh, the major research of my major research is focused on bond selective imaging. Since my postdoc work on cars, my cars company in 2000, we have a dream. The dream is that we want to have a method to visualize the interaction, the how molecules talk to each other inside living system. This is beyond the capability of fluorescent microscopy. If we use a chemical bond, we can give the right information. But the difficulty is that we don't have enough sensitivity. Both cars and the stimulant raw mass scattering microscopy for which I'm a co-inventor are only, a bond, only sensitive to CH bound species such as minor sheets, leopard, cholesterol in cancer. So, but most molecules such as drug molecules Carbon hydrate, RNA, they work at a much lower concentration from micromolar to nanomolar level, right? In 2015, when I was invited to write this review article, I started to ask, what is the fundamental limit of this field? And it's the physics. This Rama scattering has a very small cross section, and this limits the ultimate detection to a minimal level, no matter what we do in instrumentation. Outside the Roma box, we found a mid infrared absorption, which has a much bigger cross section and it is even bigger. Recently, we did a DFT calculation through collaboration with my colleague in chemistry. We found that for a certain like, group, like azide bond, the cross section is as large as fluorescence, but it's 14 orders larger than Roma scattering. And that creates a tremendous opportunity. The difference is that the fluorescence has an emission. But after infrared excitation, we have no photon emission, but it produced heat. So this is the idea that in 2016, um, we published a new microscopy called a mid-infrared photothermal microscopy, which we use a mid-infrared laser to induce a temperature rise and change the local refraction index. Then we use a green probe, this photothermal effect by measuring the change of refraction index. I want to say that while the first paper was from Purdue in 2016, it is at the Boston University in this building on the eighth floor that we fully substantially developed this technique uh, through these papers. And this has uh, been licensed to this photothermal spec cop. So in October, uh, oh, I, one thing I want to mention that this is, uh, we are not alone in this, that this is through the, uh, uh, collaboration with my colleagues, Sanemi Anlo and Leitin, and we are not alone in this direction. My other colleagues, uh, Sean and Michelle, 
also developed photothermal spectroscopy, but from a different perspective. The story of, is that in October 2016, I give this uh, speech in the science meeting. And uh, I was lucky that time because uh, that the, the leaders of analysis was in the audience. And after my speech, they asked me for a coffee. And during the coffee, they told me that you want to convert this paper into a product. In April 2018, Mirage was announced. Mirage is a very good name because Mirage means that the contrast is from the change of refract index. After this analysis was sold to Brooker in 2019, we formed Photothermal Spectroscopy Cup to commercialize our tech at the full speed. And to allow that the Mirage has been with 70 research labs in eight different countries and create a sales of 10 million US dollars in 2022. So this has allowed much broader application of the technique that is far beyond my own research lab. Now, my final slides, there are many potential applications of this technique and we are working on one, it's called a click-free MIP image in the silent window. So the idea is that we can now use a special chemical bond such as azide or the nitride group, only two atoms as a GPS of molecules to track the molecule and to understand how the molecule talk to others in the cell. In 2022, the Nobel Prize in chemistry went to click chemistry. In this method, the azide tag of sugar enter the cell and they build the cell wall. Then a click reaction is used to conjugate a fluorescent dye like rhodamine into this molecule for visualization. However, because the click chemistry fix and change the molecule, this method can only take a one step shot of the molecule at one time. But now by our method, we can directly visualize this GPS, this azide molecule, so that we can visualize this, the, the molecule we want to study, like in this case, azido tree hollows in real space and real time, see the dynamic pathway, the metabolic pathway. And we, we don't have, we also have data showing that we can study how this molecule interacts with other molecules through vibrational spectroscopy. So after 20 years effort, I believe that we are on the right track to turn the initial dream into reality. And with this, I thank you very much for listening and thank you for being here today. All right, thank you, Shijin, congratulations. Uh, and thank you, Rana and the faculty panelists. I, I really enjoyed those comments. I hope uh, we can have a reception now and talk to each other and hopefully share some of our thoughts and create more innovation, right? This is what's supposed to happen. So make a few inventions, a few more disclosures, send them our way. All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Congratulations, Shijin.